have a, I have a confession to make. Uh, I say it's good for the soul. Uh, the other day I got a. Uh, the other day I got a message from somebody, and they were asking me for the contact information for Tony Wolf, the comedian that we had here a while back. Well, Tony and I always can, you know, we always communicate through Messenger on Facebook. So I, I get a line, I'm looking, I'm going to go to his page and copy the link so I can send it. And so I get online and then about 20 minutes later, I close my browser and I had never been to Tony's page. I had never sent him a message. I'd never gotten his contact info. I got sidetracked by uh, notifications and posts and, and everything else. And, and I'm wondering, am I the only one that does that? Do we do that? Okay. Uh, I, you know, I get, it's, and I've done, it's not just Facebook. I do it a lot of times. I'll go out into the shop, and I get out there to work on something, and before I work on it, I need to probably clean up the bench a little bit, and so I start kind of cleaning the bench, and then squirrel, you know, and I'm off on something else, and, uh, and then I go in the house, and I realize, I guess I need to finish that later. Uh, but I, the reason I say this is, in those instances, when we're talking about, you know, just you know, I'd get on Facebook or, or starting on a project and getting sidetracked. You know, the only thing that happens is that maybe we don't get accomplished what we wanted to accomplish then, or maybe it takes us a little bit job, you know, a little bit longer to get it done. And it's really no big deal. But the fact is that there are areas of our life in which getting sidetracked and getting distracted is a big deal. And we need to be very, very aware of them. And I you know, in fact, as we have been uh, studying through the book of Nehemiah, we, we really see this lesson kind of uh, playing it out. And I think we find a lesson in the danger of getting sidetracked, the danger of allowing yourself uh, to be distracted. And so if you want to, if you want to turn Nehemiah chapter 6, Nehemiah 6 is where we're going to be. And so we're not going to read the whole thing, but I would, I would definitely encourage you to go back and read it later. While you turn it out, kind of catch up. As we remember... Uh, Nehemiah is now in the, the middle of a rebuilding project, a vision that God had laid on his heart to go back and to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem. And so, you know, we know that he went and, uh, and he checked it out and now he has got all of this going. He started the project. They're about halfway through it. But one of the things that I had told you was that, you know, this didn't make everybody happy because there were enemies in the region, namely uh, Sambalot, Tobiah, and Geshem, uh, as well as others who lived in the area that were sworn enemies of, of Israel. And so they didn't want it done because if Jerusalem rebuilds the wall, well, then that's a sign that the city is back. But it's also, it means that they're no longer a sitting duck. They're no longer, you know, vulnerable as they were. So they don't like this. And, uh, I think one of the things that was, you know, interesting, I, as I'm reading along, and you may have seen this before, I don't know how many times I've read it, and, I, and I've missed it before. Nehemiah 6.19, we read this, that uh, about Tobiah the Ammonite. Now, keep in mind, the Ammonites are the sworn enemies of the Israelites, okay? They're, I mean, water, no, do not get along, they're the sworn enemies, and so Tobiah is one of them that is outside that doesn't want this building project to continue. But then we read this in chapter 6, verse 19. It says, moreover, they, and, and the they that he's talking about are the nobles. Uh, these are important people in the city of Jerusalem, powerful people. It says, moreover, they kept reporting to me his good deeds and then telling him, what I had said, and Tobiah sent letters to intimidate me. So in other words, Nehemiah is in the middle of it. He's gone back to, to Jerusalem, he's gone to Jerusalem to take on a job that nobody has been able or willing to do in over 14 decades. And not only does he have tough work, not only does he have enemies on the outside, but he has people who are inside the wall that are supposed to be on his side that have sworn loyalty to one of their sworn enemies, to Tobiah the Ammonite. And they're living in the city, and they're working with him every day, okay? And so, you know, as I'm looking at this, I'm kind of like, that would be hard to stay focused, wouldn't I? I think at this point, 
if I'm Nehemiah, I'm kind of like, just forget it. Uh, anybody else just want to throw their hands up and say, I'm done? Okay, there, there's no way this is going to get done. And, and at the very least, I think sometimes, you know, in a situation like that, you get so much on your mind. What's the old saying? Your head's not in the game. Yeah, it would be hard to stay focused. It would be hard to stay motivated in something like that when you know that you have got all of this that is against you. And, and the reason I just say that is because you know, I think there are times, as I said, in our lives where being distracted or getting sidetracked, you know, is not really a big deal, but there are other areas of our life in which it is a huge deal. And this is where we need to be able to learn from the lesson of Nehemiah, to learn from, uh, from the way that he didn't get distracted, from the way that he stayed on, uh, on message, and honestly, from his response. His response, we're going to read it here in a little bit. Uh, it is one of my, honestly, it's one of my favorite passages in the Bible, and so uh, you'll, you'll find out a little bit later. But one of the first lessons that we need to learn is when it comes to, you know, to getting sidetracked is we need to understand what are the things that do pull us off a of mission. You know, what are the things that, that get us going in another direction? Nehemiah knew that he had enemies that were outside of of the wall. He knew that, that he had people inside the wall who had sworn allegiance to these people. And so he looked at them as such. And he also viewed their actions as enemies. Okay. And I think that one of the reasons that, that this is important is because there are two things that tend to derail us from the mission or the vision that God has placed on our lives. Okay. And that is, number one is being distracted, and the other is being busy. Those are two things that we need to recognize for what they are. We all know that Satan is the great deceiver. He is also the great distractor. And he will take anything that he can to try and distract you and pull you off of the vision and the mission that God has placed on your heart. And... I, I want to caution you on this, though, because please don't fall into the trap of believing that if Satan is distracting you, that it's all evil and bad stuff, because that's not the case. There's a lot of things that distract us that are good things, okay, but they're not as good. I, I, what there is, I think sometimes, uh, well, think of it this way. If you go out, okay, you go out to the shop or you know, garage, whatever, you're going to do something and squirrel. You get over here on something else, and you start to do it. Does that mean that the, that the squirrel job is bad? No. It may have been something that needed to be done. But the thing is, at the time when you went out, it was not what you set out to do. And, and here's what I, here is what Nehemiah understood that we need to understand. There is a difference between things that you should do and things that you could do. Okay? The, and, and that's the deal is that the devil will so many times... He will distract us from the things that we should do and focus us on the things that we could do. They're still good things, but they're not the main thing. They're not the most important thing. Uh, you know you need to spend time with your kids. Okay, You want to have quality time with your kids. You want to do something. You want to take them somewhere. You want to connect with them. But at the same time, there's a project that you need to get done at work, and you could put in a couple hours, and you'd be able to get it done. One is something you should do. The other is something that you could do. And we tend to get distracted, okay, that all said, well, I could go put in a couple hours and finish up this project. I could go in there and do this. But the thing is, is that what you should do? No. Okay, so if you're talking about should versus could, we need to understand which is more uh, important. Uh, you know, in the same way, I think we all, you know, distractions are always sneaky. Uh, we know, we know, does God want you in worship? There's a reason that it is one of the Ten Commandments, and it's not to be mean to anybody. It's because God knows that we need rest. That is the reason that there is a Sabbath day, a day of rest. But you know what happens, okay? 
we end up with this problem that all of a sudden Sunday becomes the only day that we can sleep in. Sunday's the only day we can get the housework done. It's the only way we can get the yard work done. It's the only day that we can do any of this stuff. Why? Because we, you know, we got we got so much going on. And so, you know, there's all of these things that are happening. And so there's this tournament that the kids really want to be involved in that's really cool. Or there's this exhibit that is coming to town that everybody would love to go to. And so what do we do? We go to the things that we could do rather than focusing on the thing that we should do. How about this? Here's one for you. Why is it that you see, and and we're seeing them now, so many marriages, 25, 30 years of marriage and raising kids that are falling apart and ending in divorce? Could it be? Yeah. I think that a lot of times what happens is the husband or the wife or, or both get so distracted with raising the kids and on the kid's life that they forget to focus on their marriage. One is the thing that you should do. The other is something that you could do. And and the thing is that focusing on the kids, it's not a bad deal. I mean, I'm saying it's something you don't want to do, but we need to understand what we should compared to what we could do. And, And I know we always say, well, that'll never happen to us. That'll never happen to me. Uh, that's why the enemy uses distractions because we don't see them coming. We're so busy looking over here at something else, we don't even notice what we should be doing over here. And and so here's why I think we see a, a perfect example of this playing out in in Nehemiah chapter six. Uh, you know, Nehemiah's building; they got the wall up to halfway, and and you've got you know Sambalot and Tobiah and Geshem out there. And, and basically what they're doing is they want, to, they want to do a peace treaty. And now, you know, think about this for a second. So here you've got, they, they read this letter, or they send this letter to Nehemiah. And basically what the letter says is they go, hey, 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 you rebuilding the wall? This looks like you might be rebelling against the king of Persia. It looks like you might be planning a revolt, and it may just be a misunderstanding. But I think what we need to do is we need to get together, we need to confer, we need to discuss, we need to kind of lay this all out and make sure that everybody's on the same page, because we would hate for something bad to happen to you because of just a misunderstanding. That's the letter they send, right? Now, if you are the governor of of Judah, if you're the if you are the guy that's over Jerusalem here, doesn't that seem like a a good thing to do? Doesn't that seem like a something that you could do and something that would be beneficial to your people? You'd think so. Keep the peace. Keep from having them attack us. We don't want the king to think that we're bad people. What he knows, though, is that they're not trying to help him. They're trying to hurt him. That their job is not about understanding why he's building the wall, but stopping him from building the wall. It is to distract him from what is important. And so what is, and this is where Nehemiah gives them, like I said, I, I love this phrase. So, so learn it, listen to it. You can even memorize it. And then a little bit later on here in the message, I'm going to show you how to apply it. Okay. Nehemiah 6.3, he says, I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? Now, which sounds a little bit... <laughs> Sounds a little bit rude, doesn't it? Kind of sounds like he's being a jerk. They send a letter. Hey, we'd really like to help you. We'd really like to you see and make sure this isn't a misunderstanding. Nehemiah says, I ain't got time for you. Not going to happen. Okay? And, and it does. It sounds kind of like he's being a, a jerk here. But the thing is that Nehemiah understands God has laid a vision on his heart. And so there is the thing that he should do, which is to finish the wall. And then there are the things that he could could do. He, he could go meet with them, but the thing is that that's not what's important. And, I, and here's one of the keys. It, it is, there is a gift, we talk about it sometimes, uh, called discernment. And it is spiritual discernment is understanding where something comes from. Is it coming from, uh, is it coming from the Spirit? Is it coming from Satan or is it coming from self? Okay, understanding what it is when you feel like you need to do something, understanding what it is that is calling you to do it. Because if it's something that's coming from God, then it is something that you should do. If it's something coming from self, then it's just something that you could do. And you need to always pick 
what God calls you to do. There, there are a lot of good things that you could do. But if God lays something on your heart, or the Word tells us to do it, then that is what we should do. That is the thing that takes priority. And so, you know, he knows that he's fulfilling God's mission. And so what does he say? He's basically, sorry, the rest of the stuff ain't going to happen. Okay. The, the second force that's kind of in play here is the fact that he knows that those outside the wall are not on the same team that he is. Okay. And so there will be times when you will have people, and this is the thing about distractions, uh, you know, there will be people who will come alongside and they'll say, hey, we're pulling on the same rope. The problem is they're pulling in the opposite direction. And Nehemiah understands that. He says, you guys are not with me. You don't have the things of God in mind. You have the things of man in mind. And so therefore, I don't have time for you. I'm not going to come down. Why should this work stop? The work that God has called me to do so that I can come down there and talk to you about something else. No, it is not going to happen. And I, it's one of the things, when we feel like God is calling us to do something, uh, and like, whether it is because you read it in Scripture, whether it is because He just laying it on your heart, uh, then those are the things that we should do, and we need to make them a priority no matter what. The other thing that... It's a weapon of the enemy, but it is also an enemy of focus, and that is busyness. Guys, I hate to say it, but we are addicted to being busy. We're, we're addicted to being busy. And I, you know, we saw this play out, I think, over COVID in a lot of ways. Uh, COVID came along, everything shut down, all of our stuff stopped, and all of a sudden we were doing what? We were, we were sitting at home. We were, we were playing board games. We were eating home-cooked meals. Uh, I mean, we were playing in the backyard. We were doing stuff. It was, I, I must admit, it was a stressful time. But I think I might have been more relaxed than I ever had been at any other time. And I also saved a lot of money. I mean, I, and that's the way it is. Like I said, we do those things and we're like, oh, this is horrible. And then we're a wise into it and we're like, this is kind of, I'm not going to tell anybody this, but I kind of like this. The problem was that then, you know, everything started coming back. And, and one of the, that's one of the, the bad things about it is that people, well, one of the good things is that people figured out that they don't have to do everything, okay? The flip side of that coin, though, is that uh, a lot of people figured out that part of the everything that they didn't want to do anymore was the things of the church, was the things of God, was being involved there. I mean, I, we know it. You may have them in your family. Uh, you know, we see them. There are folks that, that left uh, church two years ago that have never, ever been back. They left, they left things of the faith they've never, ever come back, okay? Because, you know, they, they realize, like, well, I, I don't have to do everything, so I'm going to do what I want to do, and I'm not going to do what I don't want to do. And unfortunately, one of the things they didn't want to do was, was the things that, like I said, church and God, and as, as things came back, and once again, distractions, well, this is where distractions, things started coming back, life started getting back to normal, and what happened? We got distracted by all of this stuff, and next thing you know, people had plugged in new activities or new hobbies or, or new this or new whatever, and it took the place of where God and Jesus and the church had been before, and, just, and he just got pushed out, okay? And I hope that wasn't the case in your life. I really don't, okay? I hope it wasn't the case in anybody's uh, life in your family, but it's one of the reasons that uh, Paul writes this in Ephesians 5. He says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. Why? Because the days are evil. Make the most of every opportunity. I, and here's the problem, I, and I'm as bad as anybody else on this. We tend to wear busyness as a badge of honor, don't we? Somebody comes up and goes, how you doing? Oh, so busy. How you doing? Oh, I've got, and, and what do we do? We, we tell all the things that we got to get done. And I'm as bad as anybody else. I have to correct myself, and I'm like, oh, I'm crap. I can't say that. I don't want to say that, okay? Because I don't want to be that way. 
I don't want to give you a list of how busy I am and all the things I've got to do and all the things I'm not going to get to accomplish because there's not enough hours in the day. I, I will say this, and, and I'll, guys, there are just enough hours in the day and just enough days in the week and in the year to do everything that God wants you to do. And if you can't get to those things, it's because you've crowded them out with busyness and with distractions that the enemy has laid in your feet. And so... Uh, you and I need to, here's the deal, we need to create some margin in our lives. And I think that there's, what's the old saying is that you can't, uh, you know, you can't diagnose something. You can diagnose the symptoms, but what you need to do is get to the root of it. And so I really, I think there's three things that we can do if we want to kind of cut down on busyness and distractions. The first one is the or first problem that we have is we can't say no. We, we have a hard time saying no. Uh, guys, we cannot and we should not be at the beck and call of every person who thinks that they need us. We, we can't do it. I, even at the height of his popularity, Jesus still understood that his ministry and his time with his heavenly father was more important than anything else, and he did what? He retreated and he prayed. He got away. Okay, we need to learn how to, and, and there were times I think that people thought, oh, that is so rude. No. We need to learn how to say no. And I, and I will tell you this, you need to learn how to say no and not feel guilty about it. Because that's the next thing, is then we, we say no, and then what do we do? We feel guilty after the fact, and we, we wear that around. Like, oh, I wish I could. No. We need to learn how to say no to the, because once again, there are things that we should do. There are things that we could do. We need to learn how to say no to the things that we could do so that we can focus on the things we should do. And we don't need to feel guilty about it. Okay. Secondly, uh, we can't slow down. Uh, like I said, I, we are addicted to busyness. Uh, if we're not busy doing something, then we feel like we're being lazy. Uh, and, if it, and it's not just workplace. We, we do this in every aspect of our lives. What do we do? We, uh, you know, we finish with work, we clock out, we come home, and then we fill our evenings with lessons and activities and clubs and meetings. And, and so, I mean, as soon as we get home, what do we do? We load everybody up, we drive through Burger King, we get meals, we get dinner on the way, everybody eats it on the way to this meeting, they eat it on the way to that practice, we go over here, we're doing that, and then we get home, and when we get home, we clean out all the trash out of the car, and we put it in the, we put it in the trash can, and then we go inside and we set our alarm for early in the morning and crash in bed so that we can wake up and do what? Start it all over again. We're addicted to being busy. Somehow we feel like if we're not busy, you know, I, I read something the other day. One third of Americans will not take a vacation in the year. Not because of money, because they don't have time. Because they don't have time. I heard, I heard an old saying, uh, if you won't take time for vacation. God will give you a two-week vacation in the hospital with a heart attack. Uh, I mean, it's just, it, we wear ourselves out, okay? And the third one is that we don't plan ahead. We, we need to be very intentional about planning for, for downtime. Uh, if we don't plan for downtime, we'll never take downtime. And, and the thing is to understand, busyness affects us physically, I mean, we are. We're, we're tired. We're worn out. We're beat down. We're unhealthy, okay? Uh, it affects us emotionally. We're tired. We're cranky. We're frustrated. We're all this stuff, okay? But I think probably more than anything, it affects us spiritually. I mean, it really, it affects us so much spiritually because we, you know, when we won't slow down, when we don't plan ahead, we never have time for the things of God. Like I said, we're always trying to, yeah, Sunday morning is the only morning I can sleep in. It's the only day we can do this, only day we can do that. I don't have time to get into God's word. I don't have time to pray. I know I'd love to, but I don't have time to. I heard years back uh, there was a guy that had asked Billy Graham about his time management. <coughs> Excuse me. And he asked him, he said, so, so what was it like when you got so busy with 
you know, with meetings and travel and everything else that you didn't have that, that personal time with God. And, and Billy Graham said, I don't know. I never allowed it to happen. He made it a priority. I'm not going to let busyness get in the way. I'm not going to let my schedule, I'm not going to let my travel get in the way. And I'm going to tell you this, if, if we will not make time for the important things, there will never be time for the important things. You, you got to plan. I, Clay and I, you guys know that Clay and I love to get together, and it's one of the things that we always have to remind ourselves is to just put it on the calendar. Because if we sit around and wait for the day that neither one of us got anything going on to meet in Weatherford and to talk and to pray and to spend time together, we never meet anywhere. So we have to put it on the calendar. We, we got to be intentional about our, about our prayer time, our quiet time. It, some of you have walked in and of a morning you will find me. I have, I've got a table and I've got a desk in my office. The table is my read and pray and spot. And that's what I do is I come in because I know as soon as I sit down at my desk, my computer's there and I'm going to check an email. I'm going to look at something. I'm going to type something. I'm going to whatever. And so it, it sits over there. And I, the first place I go is I sit down at this little round table. And that is where I have my, uh, I do my Bible study. That's where I do my prayer. That's where if I do any journal, it's there. Okay. Because I'm making myself and it, I'm as bad as anybody else. I walk in and I'm like, I have got a list. I got a to-do list that I need to carry over from my yesterday's to not done list that needs to go over here. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to do it. First and foremost, this is what it's going to be. Okay. And so, I, you know, we need to make these, these decisions. And so, uh, you know, as we're reading the story of Nehemiah and we, we go through things, Nehemiah had been called to, to do a job. And, and they came to him, and they tried to distract him. And what did Nehemiah say? He said, no, no, no. He goes, uh, I am doing a great work here. I'm doing a great project right here. Can't come down. Not going to stop it. I'm not going to let this work stop so that I can come down to you. And, I, you know, last week, if you guys remember, if you were here, I had asked how many of you had a, a wall in your life. And I said to look around, and what is the thing that is your wall, okay? Uh, the thing that needs to be rebuilt, the thing that you feel like God is calling you to restore and to rebuild. And, and it may be, you know, a, a lot of different things, but, you know, it may be your kids, it may be your, you know, your marriage, it may be the fact that, you know, you're looking at it and you're like, oh man, I, I, I'm not focusing here and, and my marriage needs to be restored or maybe it is stuff that's going on with your kids or with your grandkids and, and they need you right now. You know, I, I don't know what it is, but I think that all of us, you know, it, it, God has laid something on our, on our heart, okay? I, maybe it's your faith. I mean, maybe it is. you just feel like you are, you are a boat floating around with, without a rudder. And every time that the wind blows, every time that the wind changes, you feel yourself taken off in another direction. You, you get no traction. And so you look at it and to you, you know, that wall that you need to rebuild is your faith. It is your relationship with your Lord and Savior. I, I don't know what it is, but whatever the call is, whatever the wall is that God has laid in your life, I want you to hear something right now. And I, and I believe it's what God wants you to hear. It may be what you are hearing. You may have heard him say this and you just haven't responded. Whatever's on your heart, I think that God would tell you those are the walls that you should be restoring and rebuilding right now. And the rest of it can wait. Those are the things you should do, not the things that you could do. And you know, when you feel like, like you've got all these things that are vying for your attention and they're trying to distract you and, and pull you aside, this is where recognizing what they are, okay, what you should do compared to what you could do is so important. 
But what you and I have got to be able to do is, is to turn around when we feel like we're being pulled a hundred different directions, when we know God has laid something on our heart. Like I said, it may be our marriage. It may be our kids. It may be our grandkids. It may be our spiritual health. It, it may be any of those things. And we know that that's where he wants us to go. But we've got all of these distractions pulling us aside. And when we see those things, I recognize where they're coming from. They're coming from the devil. And we need to turn around and we need to look him in the eye and we need to say, no, I'm doing a great project right here. I'm not going to come down to you. I am doing a great project right here, right now. I don't have time for you. And I don't know what it looks like. We're all different. I, I think there's some of you that, that your marriage is struggling it, it is. It's, it, maybe you're filled with, with apathy. You just don't care anymore. Maybe there's tension, there's anger, there's frustration. And in that, and you know that something needs to change, and you feel like God is saying, that's the wall I want you to rebuild. But there's all kinds of stuff that's going to come up because you're going to get that call from the boss and says, hey, I got a project, and if you'll do it, you'll probably qualify for that promotion. Or here is this big paycheck, or here's this thing. You need to be able to look at that and say, you know what? No, I'm doing a great project right here in my marriage and in my home. I don't have time for that. I'm not coming down. Maybe it is your kids. Maybe it's your grandkids. I, they need you right now. Maybe they're going through a, a, a time in their life. It may be a crisis. It may be a situation. It may just be a stage of life. I don't know. But there's something going on right now, and they need you. They need your comfort. They need your direction. They need your encouragement. They need your strength. And I'm going to tell you, I think that that is God would look at you and say, that's a should do. All that stuff, that's a could do. And you need to look at them and realize, this is what I should be doing. And if the other's got to go on the back burner, that's fine. Because you know what? I'm doing a great work right here. We got parents that have decided they want to stay home. They want to be able to take care of their kids and their family. And I know that there's everything that pulls us from a hundred different directions. Say, no, you're not making an impact unless you're in the workforce. You're not making an impact unless you're out here making a name for yourself. Times are getting tough. Inflation's rising. And you're like, I don't know, man, we got to make ends meet. And I'm going to tell you what, you need to look at your kids. You need to look at your home. You need to look at what you've got going and say, no, I'm doing a great project right here, right now. And I'm not going down there. Maybe it's your face. You never seem to have time for God. You never find time to pray. When you do pick up your Bible, it reads like the back of a shampoo bottle. It just, there's nothing there. That's what you should do. That is your focus. And what you need to do is say, you know what, I, I may be a little late here. I may have to get up a little bit earlier. I may have to do this a little bit differently. But I know that this is what I should do. And I'm going to do it before I do the things I could do. I, I don't know what your wall is. And I don't know what it is that you feel like you, you're being distracted from. But I want to printed this up this morning I'm gonna we're gonna have our time of decision I'm gonna set these out here and if you've got something then I want you to come down here and grab one of these and you can put it anywhere that you want years back I printed this up stuck it on my wall today I felt I needed to add to it but it says I am doing a great work. I'm going to eliminate the unnecessary. I'm going to keep the things that are essential. I am going to stay simple. But above all, I am going to stay focused. What if you would get up every morning and that would be your commitment on whatever your wall is? If you get up and on the mirror every morning you said... In my marriage, I'm doing a great work. I'm going to eliminate the unnecessary. I am going to keep 
what is essential. I'm going to stay simple, but I am going to stay focused when it comes to your kids, to your grandkids. I am doing a great work right here, so I'm going to eliminate everything that doesn't matter. I'm going to keep what does matter, and I'm going to stay focused on it. I'm going to ask you to stand, and we're going to have our, our time of decision. We're going to have a time of prayer. Guys, if you are, we're going to open up our prayer rooms. And, and if you would like somebody to pray with you, to pray for you, you don't have to say a thing. You can step into those rooms and simply say, I need prayer. Okay? And we would love to pray with you. We would love to pray for you. Maybe you have a decision to make. Maybe you just know you're struggling. And, and you want to ask God, you want to invite him in to helping you get through this and past this. I do. I want to invite you, if, the, if that's the case, come up here, grab one of these, take it home, find you a place to put it, whether it's in your car, whether it's in your Bible, whether it's, like I said, on the mirror, it doesn't matter. But just as a reminder, so that you can say every day, I am doing a great work. I'm doing a great work right here in this area, and I cannot come down. Would you pray with me? God, you have promised that you will provide everything that we need. That God, you are right there with us every step of the way. But Lord, we are surrounded by distractions. Uh, the devil will do everything that he can to pull us away from what you have called us to do. The vision that you have laid upon our heart. And so Lord, I ask that you would open our eyes right now. God, just lay on us and, and, and let us see. It can be as clearly as, uh, God, is just sides of a piece of paper. One are the things that we should do. The other is the things we could do. And help us to get rid of the things that we could do and focus on what we should do. God, help us to lean into the, the calling, the vision that you have placed upon our lives. God, give us the, the desire, the strength, the encouragement, the passion to chase after the things that we should do so that we can fulfill the vision that you have placed upon our heart. God, be with us. We need you. We need your love. We need your power in our lives. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.